newcomers joining us today. If you have no church home, we warmly welcome you into the community of faith here at Clarity Park. Cold refreshments and fellowship will be held on the front lawn this morning after the service. On behalf of the session and congregation, I extend a very warm welcome to you, Reverend Harry Bradley, a retired minister within the Presbytery of Pickering to lead us in worship today, while our pastor remains on vacation. Reverend Bradley has served several Presbyterian congregations in Ontario over, over his 40 years of full-time ministry. He retired from Knox Asian Court in 2019, having served there for 12 years. So thank you, Reverend Bradley, for joining us this morning. We look forward to your message. The funeral service for our dear sister in Christ, Annette Bisnath, will be held this Wednesday, July 12th, at Pine Hill Cemetery, Birchmount Road and St. Clair Avenue. This will be officiated by Reverend Kevin. Visitation begins at 9.30, followed by the service at 10.30 a.m. A reception provided by the Ladies of Wings will be held after the service. May the Holy Spirit comfort us all and give us peace at this time of deep sorrow and mourning. I'd like to invite Ken Pedigrew, the convener of the Board of Managers, forward to make a, an announcement. Thank you, Ken. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Joyce has asked me to say a few words on behalf of the Board of Managers regarding some work that's going to be done uh, later this week. But first, I would like to thank all who came out on June the 24th for our work day and did so much work around the church. A special thanks to Colin for organizing it all. Thank you once again. You probably noticed that the tiles on the basement uh, floor are not in the best of shape. Over the past few years, Jim and Doug and Frank uh, have been doing the Omen's work uh, trying to fill in the gaps, but uh, we no longer have any spare tiles uh, to make any changes. So on Thursday this week, Thursday and Friday, Alexanian, uh, the same people who did the tiles here in the sanctuary last year, are going to be coming in to install new tiles in the basement. So if you see trucks in the parking lot at the end of the week, don't be alarmed, it's all planned. Uh, next Sunday you'll be able to check out the new floor in the basement. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It is my pleasure to have the opportunity to worship with you this morning here at Clarely Park. Park. Well, Reverend Kevin is away with his wife on vacation. Uh, we pray for him and his wife as they travel home within the next day or so especially with the unfortunate news that has come to this congregation. This is this not a sudden and unexpected death. We pray for you as a congregation, and we'll include that later in our pastoral prayers, but also for Reverend Kevin and his wife Irene, as they, in their own way, minister not only to her family, but of course to the family of God here at Clarelee Park. May God bless all of you. It is my pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Harry Bradley, as has been mentioned by Joyce. And uh, I have enjoyed over the past, I can honestly say over the past four years, there's very few Sundays where I am not somewhere. And uh, yet I've never had the opportunity to uh, worship with you uh, in those four years. So I was quite pleased when Kevin asked me to come and be a part of this uh, gathering this morning, and uh, it is my joy and privilege to be with you today. 
As we come to praise God, we lift up our hearts in song and in prayer. And so I'd invite you, if you are able, please stand as we join in our opening response, Holy, Holy, Holy. and merciful, abounding in steadfast love, with all God's creation, give thanks to the Lord. In worship, let us speak of God's glory and tell of God's wonder. Together we join in praise of this here opening hymn number 425. We praise you, O God. So we come as God's people together to praise and adore God, but also to open ourselves up to God's forgiving power. Let us join first in the prayer of adoration. Together we pray. God of grace, you bless us with a new day full of possibilities for us to experience your love. For you are our creator who breathes into us new life daily. And you surround us with your compassionate care, even when we doubt your presence. O Lord, our God, when we cry out to you in distress, you bring us through desperate circumstances. 
You alone can quiet the storms to a whisper. You can hush the sea's waves, so great is your power. Help us then to trust in you, that whatever we may face, we will know that you will lead us to the harbor we've been hoping for. And because of that, we offer you our thanks and our praise. I invite you now to join together in the prayer of confession that is written before you as we say together. Wise and patient God, you offer us peace, yet we confess life often feels frustrating and unsettled. You offer us courage, yet we are resentful when life is challenging. You offer us a mission with meaning and purpose but we are preoccupied with our own plans and desires. Forgive us, O oh God, and draw our attention back to you. Amen. Christ offers to each of us peace for our troubled soul. So have faith and trust in the one whom even the wind and the seas obey. For in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I invite you to share that gift of God's peace and forgiveness with one another by sharing the peace in whatever manner you are comfortable with. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also be you. We come to, uh, I always think it's a very enjoyable moment. Uh, and that's with young people, or the young at heart, and so that includes all of us. And before we get to that, though, I'm going to sing probably the earliest Christmas or Christian hymn I ever learned as a young child. I heard my mother singing it from as long as I can remember back. I think everyone who is here probably has heard it at least once uh, in their life, and uh, if you haven't, you'll catch on very quickly. It's the familiar Christian song, Jesus Loves Me. Number 373. I, I'm not sure. Do you stand here in there? If you're, you're welcome to stand. They don't always convey quite openly to the congregation. And one is not to knock so over your glass of water. I've done that more than once. But not today, fortunately. 
look, I want to share with you, we come to the children's moment. I always say to the congregation, if you listen carefully to the children's moment, you ought to know what the sermon's all about. Okay, the second secret is this. If for some reason you're not listening carefully to the children's story and it goes right over your head, before the pastor begins to speak, read carefully the sermon title. That ought to tell you what the sermon's all about. And then if you think you have enough, you're welcome to pray or not off or whatever happens to be your choice. I'm glad to be here. So we have young people. I'm very happy to meet with them at the front of the church here for a few minutes. And I hope the rest of you, wanting to know what the sermon is before you get there, will listen in. Okay? Let's just meet both. Do we have any brave ones? Hi. How are you? Good. Wow. Great. Great. Okay, I'm going to stand just because that allows me to share it with the adults as well, okay? But I'm going to show it to you. I went on vacation a while ago, and I came across something that I've never seen anywhere else. It was in a place called Pennsylvania, it's in the United States, and I was traveling down there to a conference, and I had a day off, so I thought I'd do some traveling around Butler, Pennsylvania, and into the countryside, I came across out of nowhere, a place that made glass tubing and glass sculpture, you know, glass blowing all about. You've ever seen it? They take really hot glass and they blow it into different objects. And they can be anything. You work so hard, they can be stuff that you can use every day. And I pick up something that can be used every day. Now, I have to confess, my late father loved to go fishing. And I loved to go fishing with him, not because I was good at fishing but because I just enjoyed the time together. So when I was out vacationing, I came across a most interesting thing that helped people who like to fish. Anyone like to fish? No? Have you ever done fishing? Uh, anyone out here? We've got a couple. Okay. That's good. Keep an eye on this. You may want one. This is a box. What's in the box? is the most unique thing I've ever seen. I've not seen one since, believe it or not. This is called a Pennsylvania minnow tube. Yeah, you know what a minnow is? It's a small fish. And they're usually pretty much alive. The idea is you have a glass tube, okay, and it has holes in it so water can go through it. And it has Cork on the top. What you do is you put a live fish at the front. Not a live fish because it wouldn't last very long. But I brought a gummy fish. Okay, let's take a gummy fish. So let's pretend this is a live fish. Okay, what you do is you put the fish into the tubes. Okay, and then you take the cork. While the fish is inside, you put the cork back on the tube. And then you attach this thing with the fish inside onto your fishing reel. And you cast it out into the water. Now, I'm sure the fish inside doesn't appreciate that. <laughs> I'm certain. But it's going along for the ride. You know what the object is? You have hooks on the outside. And the thing is, in nature, little fish attract bigger fish who think the little fish are their dinner. And we don't want that to happen, right? It will see the little fish inside, and the bigger fish will come up and maybe get caught on the hook without ever touching the little fish inside. It's got water in there. It has uh, water can circulate and all that. And guess what? The holes are not so big that the big fish can get inside. So oddly enough, the little fish, even though it's probably very frightened of the big fish, is safe. And the big fish can't hurt it. 
And it can do that all day long. That's something interesting, isn't it? The little fish is safe because of this thing. And the thing is that the little fish probably doesn't see the tube all that well. It only sees water. And so when it sees a bigger fish coming toward it, it's going to feel a little frightened, I'm sure. But whether it knows it or not, there is a shield, a protection of it. And so the big fish can't get the little fish inside. It's protected, and in a weird sort of way, it's safe. Now, the reason I'm telling you that story is because there are days when we sometimes feel upset. Maybe we're afraid of something. Maybe we're a little fearful that something's not good for us. And we need to be able to feel a sense of, of that we're going to be safe and protected. Now, in the story I'm going to talk about a little later, it happens with Jesus' friends, his disciples. And they went out on a, a lake one day, and it was nice and calm, and everyone was having a good time. Jesus went downstairs, and he fell asleep. That's how tired he was. And before they knew it, in the middle of the night, suddenly there was a big storm. And the waves tossed the boat up and down. And the disciples, Jesus' friends, like this little fish inside, were pretty afraid. They thought it was all over for them. And they went down and they saw Jesus not upset. He was sleeping. And they woke him up and said, Jesus, aren't you concerned that we're all right? We're safe? Jesus didn't get upset. He said, just trust me. And went up, and with all that waves blowing over and all the winds casting the boat about, Jesus said two words. He said, peace. Peace. And be still. And at that moment, the storm disappeared. And like the little fish inside this mineral tube, he said, why don't you trust me? I'll keep you safe. And that's something we wrestle with even as we grow into adults. We sometimes get very afraid of things. And sometimes we need to be afraid. But we also need to realize that God is there for us. And like this mineral too, we may not always see God in our midst, but we know that we're being protected and comforted by God. And so we're safe, even in the moments when we might feel very afraid. And God brings wonderful people in our lives, a parent, a friend, and they protect us as well. Just something to think about. If you go fishing, or you're just living your life, with God's help, we can have peace, and we can be still. And that's what we call faith. Say a prayer together, is that all right? Okay, say a prayer. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for today and for the assurance that you are always with us in the good times and in the times when we are fearful, we can always trust and have faith that you are with us to comfort us, to guide us, and protect us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hope you have a wonderful day and a great week ahead.
the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in, in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you, I will say to the north, give up. Give them up, and to the south, do not hold back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. On that day, when even had came, had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side, and leave the crowd behind. They took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion, and they woke, woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord.
what a beautiful summer day it is this morning. <clears throat> and uh, probably my most favorite time of year. Although as a true born and bred Canadian, I know that winter is usually here for seven or eight months. And, and then we suddenly have summer. It seems to come very quickly. And already we passed the longest day, and if you've been keeping track, you won't notice it for about a month or so. But the sun is starting to get a little lower and sinking a little quicker into the west. Anyways, it is the beginning of summer, and for all the young people and all the young at heart, those who may be traveling, I hope it is a wonderful and safe and enjoyable summer for you. I often think back to when I was a youngster growing up in Hamilton, Ontario. That's my hometown. I grew up in the north end, the industrial end of the city at that time. And, uh, and for me, summer was an active time. Uh, we were out, we did a lot of things as uh, friends, we went places. I probably walked uh, in those summers further than I have ever walked since, but uh, we enjoyed it. Most of my summers were in the inner city. It was in what I call the concrete jungle of uh, inner city Hamilton in the North End. But I do remember in the summer of 1968, I was barely 14, and uh, we had a special holiday that year. As a holiday, our family traveled one day to a cottage that was owned by a friend of my father, one he worked with, and he owned a cottage on the shores of the Grand River. Now, that may not seem like the most exciting trip for most of you, but for a boy who spent most of his summer months in the concrete jungle of inner city Hamilton, this time away out of the city away from business and busyness was a treat and we looked forward to its great anticipation. Well, when we arrived at the cottage on the Grand River, it was a beautiful summer day. There were blue skies. There were, it was sunny. There was a warm breeze gently blowing. Well, we had lunch, and after lunch, my father's friend offered to take us out for a short cruise of the Grand River on a pontoon raft that he had recently built. My father, my two other brothers, and I agreed to go along and take We come to, uh, I always think it's a very enjoyable moment. Uh, and that's with young people, or the young at heart, and so that includes all of us. And before we get to that, though, I'm going to sing probably the earliest Christmas or Christian hymn I ever learned as a young child. I heard my mother singing it from as long as I can remember back. I think everyone who is here probably has heard it at least once uh, in their life, and uh, if you haven't, you'll catch on very quickly. It's the familiar Christian song, Jesus loves me. Number 373. I, I'm not sure. Do you stand during this? If you're, you're welcome to stand.
it. I want to share something with you. Whenever I come to a congregation for the first time, I like sharing secrets that pastors know, or should know, that they don't always convey quite openly to the congregation. And one is not to knock so over your glass of water. I've done that more than once. But not today, fortunately. Look, I want to share with you. We come to the children's moment. I always say to congregation, if you listen carefully to the children's moment, you ought to know what the sermon's all about. Okay? The second secret is this. If for some reason you're not listening carefully to the children's story and it goes right over your head, before the pastor begins to speak, read carefully the sermon title. That ought to tell you what the sermon's all about. And then if you think you have enough, you're welcome to pray or not off or whatever happens to be your choice. I'm glad to be here. So we have young people. I'm very happy to meet with them at the front of the church here for a few minutes. And I hope the rest of you wanting to know what the sermon is before you get there will listen in. Okay? Let's just meet for Do we have any brave ones? Hi, how are you? Good. Wow, great, great. Okay, I'm going to stand just because that allows me to share it with the adults as well, okay? But I'm going to show it to you. I went on vacation a while ago, and I came across something that I've never seen anywhere else. It was in a place called Pennsylvania, it's in the United States, and I was traveling down there to a conference and I had a day off, so I thought I'd do some traveling around Butler, Pennsylvania. And into the countryside, came across, out of nowhere, a place that made glass tubing and glass sculpture. You know, glass blowing and all about it. You ever seen it? They take really hot glass and they blow it into different objects. And they can be anything. You can work so hard, they can be stuff that you can use every day. And I pick up something that can be used every day. Now, I have to confess, my late father loved to go fishing. And I loved to go fishing with him, not because I was good at fishing, but because I just enjoyed the time together. So, when I was out vacationing, I came across a most interesting thing to help people who like to fish. Anyone like to fish? No? Have you ever done fishing? Uh, anyone out here? Without ever touching the little fish inside. It's got water in there, 
It has uh, water can circulate and all that. And guess what? The holes are not so big that the big fish can get inside. So oddly enough, the little fish, even though it's probably very frightened of the big fish, is safe. And the big fish can't hurt it. And it can do that all day long. That's something interesting, isn't it? The little fish is safe because of this thing. And the thing is that the little fish probably doesn't see the tube all that well. It only sees water. And so when it sees a bigger fish coming toward it, it's going to feel a little frightened, I'm sure. But whether it knows it or not, there is a shield, a protection of it. And so the big fish can't get the little fish inside. It's protected, and in a weird sort of way, it's safe. Now, the reason I'm telling you that story is because there are days when we sometimes feel upset. Maybe we're afraid of something. Maybe we're a little fearful that something's not good for us. And we need to be able to feel a sense of that we're going to be safe and protected. Now, in the story I'm going to talk about a little later, it happens with Jesus' friends, his disciples. And they went out on a, a lake one day, and it was nice and calm, and everyone was having a good time. Jesus went downstairs, and he fell asleep. That's how tired he was. And before they knew it, in the middle of the night, suddenly there was a big storm. And the waves tossed the boat up and down. And the disciples, Jesus' friends, like this little fish inside, were pretty afraid. They thought it was all over for them. And they went down and they saw Jesus not upset. He was sleeping. And they woke him up and said, Jesus, aren't you concerned that we're all right? We're safe? Jesus didn't get upset. He said, just trust me. And went up, and with all that waves blowing over and all the winds casting the boat about, Jesus said two words. He said, peace. Peace. And be still. And at that moment, the storm disappeared. And like the little fish inside this mineral tube, he said, why don't you trust me? I'll keep you safe. And that's something we wrestle with even as we grow into adults. We sometimes get very afraid of things. And sometimes we need to be afraid. But we also need to realize that God is there for us. And like this mineral tube, we may not always see God in our midst, but we know that we're being protected and comforted by God. And so we're safe, even in the moments when we might feel very good. And God brings wonderful people in our lives, our parents, our friends, and they protect us as well. There's something to think about. If you go fishing, or you're just living your life, with God's help, we can have peace, and we can be still. And that's what we call faith. Can we have a prayer together? Is that all right? Okay, have a prayer. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for today and for the assurance that you are always with us in the good times and in the times when we are fearful. We can always trust and have faith that you are with us to comfort us, to guide us, and to protect us. In Jesus' name. Hope you have a wonderful day and a great week ahead. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my by your name. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. 
and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in, in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you, I will say to the north, give up. Give them up, and to the south, do not hold back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. On that day, when even had came, had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side, and leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him, a great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion, and they woke, woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Summer day, 
it is this morning. <clears throat> and uh, probably my most favorite time of year. Although as a true born and bred Canadian, I know that winter is usually here for seven or eight months. And, and then we suddenly have summer. It seems to come very quickly. And already we passed the longest day, and if you've been keeping track, you won't notice it for about a month or so, but the sun is starting to get a little lower and sinking a little quicker into the west. Anyways, it is the beginning of summer, and for all the young people and all the young at heart, those who may be traveling, I hope it is a wonderful and safe and enjoyable summer for you. I often think back to when I was a youngster growing up in Hamilton, Ontario. That's my hometown. I grew up in the north end, the industrial end of the city at that time. And, uh, and for me, summer was an active time. Uh, we were out, we did a lot of things as uh, friends, we went places. I probably walked uh, in those summers further than I have ever walked since, but uh, we enjoyed it. Most of my summers were in the inner city. It was in what I call the concrete jungle of uh, inner city Hamilton in the North End. But I do remember in the summer of 1968, I was barely 14, and uh, we had a special holiday that year. As a holiday, our family traveled one day to a cottage that was owned by a friend of my father, one he worked with, and he owned a cottage on the shores of the Grand River. Now that may not seem like the most exciting trip for most of you, but for a boy who spent most of his summer months in the concrete jungle of inner city Hamilton, this time away out of the city away from business and busyness was a treat and we looked forward to it with great anticipation. Well, when we arrived at the cottage on the Grand River, it was a beautiful summer day. There were blue skies. There were, it was sunny. There was a warm breeze gently blowing. But well, we had lunch, and after lunch, my father's friend offered to take us out for a short cruise of the Grand River on a pontoon raft that he had recently built. My father, my two other brothers, and I agreed to go along and take the trip. And so as we journeyed out onto the water, it was quite a bit of excitement, and everything appeared to be just fine. About 45 minutes in, uh, the decision was made, well, let's go back and enjoy the afternoon fishing and other things that we would do around there. So he, my father's friend turned the raft around and headed back to where we started. Now, this is where things began to change. Shortly after turning the raft around, Everything began to change rather rapidly. The blue sky that we had been graced with began to fill up with deep, dark, high clouds that grew darker by the moment. There was a noticeable drop in the air temperature. And that gentle breeze had become a blustery wind. With the storm clouds, clouds brewing, a gentle rain that had begun to fall eventually turned into sheets of water that were pelting us sideways. The calm river had become suddenly a raging current of waves that were washing over the decks of this raft. And that gentle breeze, it was now a chaotic and blustery wind, still we pressed on. We were about a hundred some odd feet from the dock. And my father's friend made what turned out to be a fateful decision. He abruptly turned the raft directly towards the shoreline. 
directly into that gusting wind. In the next moment, the wind that was blowing our way filled the canopy that was above us, literally lifted the raft out of the water, and a moment later dropped it right back in, crashing hard down on the waves. And in that moment, I knew the meaning of fear. In a blink of an eye, my world turned literally upside down. Apparently, when the pontoon had come down and made hard contact with the river, there were some rocks below, and one or two of them had burst. And that left the raft on a terrible tilt, listing into the water below. The next thing I knew and can remember, I was sliding in the wrong direction. I was sliding toward the leaning half quickly down a perilous slope towards that raging river. And just when I thought I was about to fall into this murky water below, somehow, somewhere, I felt a hand grab my shirt collar and yank me up to some sense of safety. I looked and I saw my father Somehow he was able to stretch out one of his hands and grab me by the collar of my shirt. With his other hands, he had snagged my other two brothers. And in that moment, I experienced what we might call faith. Faith in my father. I trust that my father would be there to protect me in the storms of my life. The early Christian writer we know of as the evangelist Mark, he shared a similar story that was read a few moments ago. In retelling Jesus' public ministry, the writer Mark makes it clear to those who would listen to his gospel that in Jesus' ministry, he was a very busy man. Right from the very beginning to almost the very end, Jesus is a man in motion. He is either preaching, or he is healing, or he is helping, or he is listening, or he is exercising demons. He is doing something almost in every moment. But as we come near to the end of chapter 4, finally Jesus seems to take a break. It's been the end of a long day. He's been healing people from sunup to sundown. He's had demand after demand on his time, on his power, on his compassion. This, of course, was his ministry. Jesus was to take God's good news of a new beginning, a new start, a healing, a reconciliation, to the world in which he lived. Indeed, the evangelist Mark began his gospel saying, look, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom or reign of God has come near to us. Repent and believe or trust in the good news. These were the essence of what Jesus was all about. But obviously, days like that can be very tiresome. When people are pressing upon you not only during the daytime, but even well into the evening, it takes a toll. And among us, Jesus was as human as any of us. He needed some form of rest and restoration. And so in order to rest and be restored in his own soul and body and spirit, Jesus suggests that he and his disciples escape for a while, get across the Lake of Galilee to get away from the crowds, Well, some did follow him in boats. Now, that didn't seem to be a big request of his disciples. They were all mostly experienced fishermen. They had been on the Lake of Galilee many, many times before. They knew that lake as well as they knew the back of their hand. These were not novices. And yet, they get into the boat, and in the calm of the evening, Jesus finally seeks a place below to lay his head to rest 
and to get some much needed sleep. Well, halfway through the night, suddenly we're told a windstorm erupts. A great windstorm blows up on the lake, and that storm was so unexpected, so great, that the ship which they were in was being tossed about on the waves. The rainwater was washing in over the decks. It threatened to capsize the ship and drown everyone aboard in any moment. In fact, remember, these were experienced fishermen, but even then, in this moment, they knew fear. They thought they were about to perish. They were not prepared for that fear that was overtaking them. Nothing prepared them for that fear that gripped them now. And in their fear and their sense of hopelessness, everything appeared to be lost. And afraid for their lives, we read, they ran to find Jesus. And they found Jesus downstairs in the midst of this chaos, gently sleeping. Can you imagine? So they shook him. They tried to wake him up quickly. They screamed at Jesus to do something. In desperation they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jan Holton teaches uh, pastoral care at Yale Divinity School. And she does not deny the fear that was felt by Jesus' disciples. Their fear was real. It's that same kind of fear that threatens to overwhelm you and myself in the unexpected storms of our life, in those moments when everything seems chaotic all of a sudden. And she writes these words. She says, indeed, the question the disciples ask of Jesus, filled perhaps with equal measures of indignation and bewilderment, conveys to others their fear. Do you not realize that we are about to die? Do you not care that we are about to perish? The former is a question of survival. The latter one is one of value. In effect, they're saying, Jesus, are we not important enough for you to save us? Does not God not care when our lives are in chaos and the difficulty is more than we can bear? You see, even in this time when everything appears lost, Jesus does not panic. He doesn't jump out of bed with a start. He doesn't suddenly realize that there's so much panic around that he has to join in it. Instead, he gets up gently. He goes up onto the shore or on the deck, deck of the boat. He looks at the storm, but he does not panic. He says two simple commands. He says, peace. Be still. And in that moment, calm replaces the chaos and it's smooth sailing ahead. The disciples are flabbergasted. They can't understand it. In a gentle but firm rebuke of his followers, Jesus turns to them and asks a very provocative question. He says, why are you afraid? Then he says, have you still no faith? I'm sure if you and I were on those decks that day, we wouldn't understand how he can say so calm and accuse us of having little or no faith. Our lives are at stake in these moments. Have you no faith? What is this faith that Jesus is speaking about in this passage? You know, I find today people both within the Christian community and many people who are outside the Christian church understand faith as something that really wasn't understood as such in the scriptures. We understand faith as agreeing to certain doctrines or beliefs or creeds that we recite. That's our faith. People say, what's your faith about? We say, well, we say the Apostles' Creed, or we say the Nicene Creed, or we have the, the new statements of faith and the living faith. 
That is a set of beliefs that we have, that we hold dear about how we understand God, how we know Jesus, or how God is working in and through us in the world. We say that's our faith. It's cognitive. It's up in our head. Faith becomes very cerebral. Faith becomes theological arguments that we possess and we cherish and we pass on. But I'm going to argue it was not so in the time of Jesus. The Greek word that we so often translate as faith, and is translated here as well, comes from the word pistis. And pistis is a term that is not cerebral in nature. It talks about a relationship. It's relational. To speak of faith as relational, it is how we relate to one another, how we relate to God, how we relate with each other. That's faith. Rather than being understood as beliefs that we have in books that we can take off our shelf and read, recite, and argue about, faith is simply having trust in somebody else. Enough trust that you're willing to risk your life for them. Think of your partner. Think of your closest friends. Faith is not an agreement you make between each other. Faith is an understanding that brings you together and keeps you together in glue. You've learned to trust that person with your secrets, with your fears, with your moments of misunderstanding. You trust that, that person is going to be there in the storm of life. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about, do you believe in God the Father? No, he's saying, do you trust that God is your Father? Do you trust that God is so involved with you that God would never let any harm come to you unnecessarily? It's like that uh, Pennsylvania mineral tube. Well, we may not always see it, but Jesus is saying that shield is always around you. That's what faith is all about, folks. Many years ago, I came across a Christian therapist named David Augsburger. He presented faith as a relationship. And he says, faith is a balance of two things that are very relational. Risk and trust. You can only risk as much as you're willing to trust another person. And likewise, you can only trust as much as you're willing to risk. And that's faith. Jan Holden suggests, if we believe this story concerns only Jesus' ability to fix the chaos in our lives, then we are missing out on what was revealed about the deeper meaning of faith, and so about a relationship with God. For Jesus asks us to have faith that whatever threatens us in this day or keeps us awake at night, even if our very life is under threat, it cannot overcome the power of Jesus to bring us peace and strength. That the God who routinely upends all that we expect is able to transform our fear into courage. That's faith. You know, it ought not surprise us that the earliest images of the Christian community is that of a ship. A ship on a storm-tossed sea. When the World Council of Churches were formed in the years following the dark days of the Second World War, they chose as their main symbol for the universal church a storm-tossed boat with a cross for a mass. Lamar Williamson Jr., who taught at Union Theological Seminary, gives an insight to the story of Jesus by stilling the storm by saying, the stilling of the storm continues to reassure the church in every time of persecution and distress that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the ruler of nature and history, and that he is present with his disciples in their anxiety. Faith is not an idea that we're asked to believe only in our minds. Faith is growing in a relationship where we're willing to trust God with our very lives. Jesus asked this same question 
of his followers in every age. Why are you afraid? Do you not trust yet trust God whose reign over us is already present in me? You know, in the early years of developing Christian communities, many of the stories about Jesus of Nazareth circulated, and especially his public ministry. They were shared over years before they were eventually brought together by those we call the gospel writers, people like Mark and Matthew and Luke. And when the gospels were written and they were circulated, it wasn't merely factual history or the life of Jesus they were telling. There was another question they were addressing right from the very beginning, and that was the most important one. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? And Mark states in his very opening words what his conclusion is going to be. Even before you read anything about Jesus' life, he states clearly who Jesus of Nazareth truly is. He says, in the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Period. When we're being tossed about in the storms of life, we can focus on the threats that are around us, we can react with fear, or we can place our trust in the one who meets us even in the midst of our struggles. He will meet us in the storms of our life with those simple commands. He'll say to us, peace, wholeness, healing, be still. And whether they are our own personal struggles that we are wrestling with, or even challenges that we may face as a congregation, Jesus' question calls to us in chaotic times of our lives to have faith, to trust in the one who will meet us even there in the midst of the storm and reassure us that we are not alone. Peace, be still. God is with us. God's people surround us. And the God whom we know in Jesus, the living Christ, he will bring a calm and a hope that is able to still the storm that rage within our hearts. Jesus, the living Christ, who stands among us in the midst of whatever storm we may happen to be in at the moment, will still ask of us, why are you afraid? Can you not yet trust in the God you see in me? Amen. At this time, we uh, join in our tithes and our offerings and we give thanks to the Lord God. The God's steadfast love that endures not only today, but forever. Our offering is now received. so much so generously but you also open our eyes up to the needs that exist within your world those that exist in our community here around Fairly Park those that exist in the city of Toronto and throughout Canada and elsewhere and we give a portion of the many blessings we enjoy that others too may be blessed in their distress accept our gifts we bring with generous and open hearts in Christ's name Amen Together we join in this time of prayer. And we think of the concerns that exist within this community of faith. We pray for God's healing spirit and comforting love to be a part of our experience. Not only today, but in the days ahead. In those times when we feel joyful, we celebrate knowing that God is part of our success. 
But in those moments when our lives are tossed and turned by unexpected news, chaotic events, we pray that God would shadow us like a hen shadows her chicks and give us comfort and give us hope. Let's join together and keep with us not only the prayers that are placed within this box here, but also those prayers that are on our hearts. Together we pray. God of power and might, we come before you trembling with awe for all you have done, all you are doing, and all that you will do in the grand sweep of time, in the vast swath of creation. Wield your power, we pray, against all forces of nature that threaten people, homes, and land with danger and destruction. Strengthen us for the work of rebuilding wherever devastation has visited your people. Speak to us words of comfort and hope, especially to those who have lost much or maybe even everything they own and must begin yet again. For in their distress, we trust that your will for all people is life, health, and peace. Wield your power, we pray, against the forces of destruction that we have devised and are too quick to use against one another. Dismantle within us the desire for war until we dismantle the, our missiles and our bombs. We continue especially to pray for the peoples of Ukraine who are enduring an unjust war that continues to bring havoc and chaos to their lives and to their land with many unneeded death and moments of great destruction. Open our hands to embrace each other until we cannot close our hands again around the triggers of guns. Heal the enmity that divides us from our neighbors or from our families so that we might work on building bridges of new understanding and removing the walls that serve only to divide and isolate us. Give us new tunes for that ancient poetry until we all sing of beating our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks. And bring the day, please God, when there will be no more war or anger between people or nations. Wield your power too against the forces of illness and pain that overtake our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. Help our bodies and minds to overcome the diseases that threaten our well-being. Ease suffering and bring relief and rest to the weary and comfort those who are dying. Reassure us of your compassionate grace that continues to minister to us with great strength, especially in those moments of our deepest weakness. Give us courage and hope that we would trust in your gift of resurrection and new life, the harbor that we are hoping for and to reach in the storms of our lives. God of grace, Lord of our lives, be with those who particularly need your care and comfort at this time. Especially today, we lift up in faith your servant, Annette Bithna, who passed away suddenly a week ago. Now she is received into your eternal community, yet with her loss, we hold close to our hearts her many family and friends who will miss her so dearly. Surround them at this moment with your compassion in their time of mourning and grieving. And move us as your people that we would be the very presence and comfort of Christ Jesus to them in their time of distress. We especially pray for her son, Rodney, and his partner, Kate, that in this moment they might experience your peace that is beyond our understanding and see it as an anchor of strength in the turbulent time. 
We also pray for the Reverend Dr. Kevin Livingston and his wife Irene as they are traveling home from their time away. And pray that they might come back rested and prepared to minister kindly to all who are dealing with this unexpected loss of an elder and of a dear friend. May your blessed peace still our troubled hearts, that we may find calm and stillness in the midst of our chaos in you. For the miracles of creation, for the miracles of birth, love shared, a chance to begin again, reconciliation, and the miracle of faith, we give you our thanks and our praise. For we are humbled that you love us and you draw near to us, God of power and of might. And in the way of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we continue to pray together to you the prayer that Jesus offered to us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you're able to stand, please do so as we sing our closing hymn this morning. Will your anchor hold number 744? <laughs> compassion bless you the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you and lead you forward and the power of the Holy Spirit comfort you today and always and the whole people of God rejoiced and say Amen. Amen.